between 1998 and 1999, the amount of people that use the internet around the world grew by around 100 million. Um, in that same time frame, in America, the amount of people that own computers grew from 42% to 51%, uh, with internet access jumping from 26% to 41%. Um, in short, half of all people own computers and nearly half of them were using them to surf the web, um, usually with the help of those like AOL disks that you got like every four seconds. Um, this is the time frame uh, when Digimon was introduced to the world. Uh, a franchise built uh, upon an oddly progressive and gentle view of how we connect digitally with one another. Um, previously, major takes on like online interaction had been either mystified by it or oddly antagonistic of it. Um, <laughs> a, a bunch of like a bunch of people in like dark rooms and goth outfits being like, "We've broken through the firewall," and I didn't know what it, you know when this movie came out. I didn't know what a firewall was. All I knew it was bad, and so internet bad. Now, to be fair, uh, this is Digimon. A major aspect of the show is giant dinosaurs, warriors, bugs, and cyborgs fighting all sorts of bad guys made up of bits of digital code. Um, but the core ethos of the series is about connection and emotional growth with digital partners. And with a massive wave of people first coming to learn the ins and outs of the internet, but more importantly, being the first era to actively connect and make friends on a mass scale on the internet, uh, it's pretty important. And so uh, this is Digimon, a franchise that came to define a generation. Uh, but we gotta go back before then. Uh, to, to fully understand why Digimon is so special, we need to return to its origins. And we need to go back to something called the Lost Decade, a, uh, a recession that changed Japan both economically and socially. So I, I don't wanna bore you, but for a second, let's reveal the true acronym of MAGFest. <laughs> <laughs> so, a uh, short history lesson. Uh, Post-Allied occupation Japan sees a boom of economic growth. The rules of their own industries have been rewritten, and there's not just rapid business expansion, but population growth as well. Urban centers grow bigger and denser, and for a ton of people, your lives become centered around them. Uh, you, uh, you strive to go to work there in what are, what are known as salaryman roles, where in a few cases, paid not based on any kind of meritocracy, but on how long you've been with the company. So by the time you retire from the company, you're doing pretty good, and thus your family is doing pretty good. And the, the time period was so well that, that uh, economics professors have referred to it as an economic miracle. Um, but, and I'd, I'd just like you to know that keeping with the theme of late 90s and early 2000s, um, all art that's not Digimon related on here, uh, it will be clip art. Um, uh, so get ready for that. But in the late 80s, early 90s, a problem starts to appear. There is an asset price bubble growing. Um, if you don't know what those are, it's basically when stocks go up, real estate go, prices go up, prices go up in general, and people are so confident that everything's just gonna keep going up and up that they keep buying and lending and taking out loans. Um, and the Bank of Japan sees this and is like, oh, ha, man, ha, maybe we need to pull back on this a little bit, guys. Um, so they drive their rates up. But it's too little too late. Uh, the bubble pops, insurance firms and banks fail, and boom, you enter one of the worst recessions in modern history. Um, over the next decade, unemployment rates triple. And you know the, you know the term uh, hikikomori, which, you know, yeah. like, growing world skill? Um, it existed before then, but it first became popularized uh, during what was, became thus known as a lost generation of people who entered their 20s and 30s, like, you know, time when you go on, like, you try to establish yourself with a career or a job or whatever, and the economy was like, ah, come back later. So, uh, so uh, using clip art, um, I've, I've expertly detailed uh, what the lost decade was like. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it, it, entering a, an economy that doesn't want you there sounds a little familiar. Um, uh, but, you know, and you don't need a, like a long explanation of what the cultural effects that something like this can have. The Great Depression instilled a ton of people with an economic anxiety that they'd never be able to shake. Uh, the 2007 housing collapse changed irrevocably the balance of people's political beliefs across the country. It, in, uh, another thing, it also makes people lonely on a broad level. And if not lonely, more willing to cling to certain means of connection in order to find entertainment or companionship or both. For example, one year after that housing market crash in 2007, subscriptions to Xbox Live were projected to grow from 7 million to 10 million. Um, faced with a doomed economy and no hope for the future, we decided to yell at friends during Halo. <laughs> we, we seek it in all forms. Um, did you know that during that nearly one in five American households bought a pet during the first years of COVID? 23 million families. Um, back when we were sitting, like the early days of like sitting at home and masking up and playing Animal Crossing until like 3 a.m. every day, uh, we have an, we still have an innate need to care for things and be cared for. And if you're trapped in kind of an urban center, uh, in let's say a special ward of Tokyo, where all of a sudden the rug of comfort has been pulled out from under you, owning a pet is hard. Um, I lived in the dead center of Brooklyn uh, for a little while, um, and you know what the worst problem in NYC is? Uh, people might say, like, crime, the 1%. Okay, solid second uh, behind finding a place for your dog to poop. Um, every, if, if you've ever had a dog in, in the heart of a metropolis, every single concern takes a silver medal when you have gone yet another block without the tiniest patch of grass that your dog feels okay to take a dump in. Um, and for a visual reference, uh, this is... His name's Elmer. So what do you do? You think smaller. You think of a pet that you can take anywhere, not just around the house, but around the city and on trips and literally every place you could go. Um, uh, enter a game and toy creator named Akihiro Yokoi, who'd seen a commercial about a kid who sadly couldn't bring his pet turtle on a family vacation. And so he thought, what if I could create a pet that people could bring anywhere? And this idea would eventually lead to the... Now, the Tamagotchi is not, it's usually credited as the first virtual pet, but it's not really. In the mid-90s, a developer named PF Magic thought of that, and they created something called Dog, spelled D-O-G-Z, because in the 90s we were like, it's gotta be spelled with a Z, because it's cool that way. Um, which was a home computer game where you could <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can basically, if you you can see the little icons, you can raise it, you can play with it, you can let it use the bathroom, etc. But that's a, on a home computer. And when you're stuck in your like dad's big office chair and like the side of the family room, waiting for like the dial-up disc to connect so you can play dogs. Um, it kind of takes the magic out of this whole thing. Um, but oddly enough, Yokoi wasn't super concerned with the magic about the entire thing. He wanted a pet that you had to take care of and you had to clean up after because he figured that that stuff kind of made you like the dog more. Um, he said, uh, he had a quote where he was like, taking care of a pet is fun 30% of the time. It, it made a stronger bond. So even if it was work, it's a pet that you'd absolutely want to take wherever you went. Now, the benefit of hindsight uh, makes this sound pretty fun, but Bandai, the entertainment publisher, who you could pitch it to, did not think it sounded very fun. Mostly for these reasons. Um, <laughs> do you remember this? Do you remember turd, 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 dead? <laughs> Why would this be fun, they asked. Aren't the point of electronic games to be escapism? If you force them to clean up literal, not real dog poop, um, that's the exact opposite of jumping into a game and forgetting all of your anxieties that exist outside of it. Um, well, enter a woman named Aki Maita. Maita was working at Bandai and she saw promise in the idea. Uh, so much so that as these prototypes were being developed, 
she took them to the streets of Shibuya to test them out. What colors did people like? Uh, what shapes did they like? What sizes did they like? And through this, they were kind of able to chip away at the Tamagotchi. Um, and well, the rest is, you know, history. Millions and millions were sold. Demand uh, was so high that like an entire Tamagotchi black market emerged, um, where they were selling like 20 to 60 times their average price. Um, and people got so connected to these things that one could even question whether they saw them as like an electronic game anymore. And that brings me uh, to the first example of what's running, like the main running theme in this whole thing, the transcendence of the game, or in the case of Digimon, the transcendence of a franchise, or in the case of the internet, the transcendence of the soulless connection of an online world. Because for years, it was kind of like the butt of a joke, right? A source of shame it, that it, you lived in your basement and your best friends were online, that you hadn't met your significant other in glorious, sacred real life, but on the internet. And the, I, rather than pick one awful picture, I decided to go with an entire row of, when you type in nerd clip art, It's very telling that most of them on the computer, there's a guy on the computer, guy on the computer, that third guy is just reading a magazine called PC Stuff. <laughs> that guy has four monitors. And then, uh, I don't know, weird Jimmy Neutron cousin and then nerd. <laughs> but despite these like st obvious stereotypes, um, it, numbers prove otherwise. In, in 1997, AOL bragged about having 19,000 chat rooms. Um, within six months of Match.com's launch in 1995, it had 100,000 users. Um, eHarmony began in the year 2000 and got 33 million subscribers within the decade. Um, so something was working out, or at least, you know, beyond what uh, negative pop culture had to say, people wanted something to work out. A uh, need for connection that was just as real as anything in real life. Uh, something that one could see through until the end. Um, did you know in Britain they actually established a pet cemetery for Tamagotchi? Um, that had died and never been reborn. Um, uh, no one had ever pressed that little like button on the back. Um, to get back to square one, users would mail theirs over and have actual funeral services given to them. One, one doesn't get a pet back after it's gone. One doesn't get a loved one back. You reboot games, but the loss of a connection is something you honor. Um, and back to that, before we get too sad about Tamagotchi graveyards. Um, uh, Tamagotchis were a huge hit in Japan and a big hit in America, um, particularly with teenage girls. And so Bandai and the people involved were eager to figure out how they could fill out the margins a little bit and dig into some new demographics. Um, well, there was one thing that Tamagotchis didn't do. They didn't fight. <laughs> do you guys remember this commercial uh, before Digimon kind of became a franchise and it was just two kids yelling at each other in a basement somewhere. <laughs> this is, I'm gonna go back to this really quick. Eventually they'd kind of, eventually they'd kind of come out with like, the, they'd stick to like the Digimon Digital Monsters thing. That's like the logo. Um, but before that it was, you know, this thing was everywhere, really catching on. Um, but Digimon was born. Um, and what began as little blobs that fight each other quickly expanded into a manga and video games and trading card game and an anime and a backstory about a digital world that was connected to ours. And while they've all reached like certain degrees of popularity, it's kind of in the anime that Digimon found its most consistent branding and the clearest example of its themes and its structure. Um, it's also found where it found its like most rad theme songs. Um, whether in the original Japanese version, uh, Digimon Adventures Butterfly, sung by the late great Koji Wada, um, or the American version's theme, uh, where it constantly reminded us that Digimon were indeed the champions. Um, <laughs> um, for those of you that have never watched it, the, 
I, let me just fill you in. The basic plot of Digimon is this, and I, I feel the the best way to do this. I could have you know gotten like an IMDb summary or a Wikipedia summary, but I think the best way to tell Digimon's plot is through the lyrics of the ska masterpiece "Hey Digimon," which would play roughly 14 times an episode. Um, uh, and it goes something like this. Uh, seven young kids go to camp for the summer. They wind up living in a digital land where everyone gets to meet his own Digimonster, a digital companion, a digital friend. A Digimon in training will Digivolve to Rookie and Digivolve to Champion and Ultimate 2. I'm going to save the digital world for me. I'm going to save the digital world for you. Now, I, I, I kind of want to get this out of the way because it, it sits in, the, it's like the elephant in the room of every conversation you have about Digimon, and that is Pokemon. Um, which had, <laughs> the, the Pokemon's, Pokemon's great. You'll have to, I, last year I did a whole panel about the, uh, like the, how great early Pokemon designs are. You'll have to rip Pokemon from my cold, dead hands. Um, <laughs> but it was, there was a no little comparison because Pokemon kind of debuted in full in September 1998, and then the anime of Digimon uh, came out in August uh, 1999. And so you, there was this kind of clueless idea that that obviously Digimon was a uh, was some kind of you know ripoff that they rushed into production. When in reality, no. Um, and like I I get it. I get why they're compared to each other so often. You know. Uh, it, Pokemon it, it launched a thousand ships when it's come, whether it's monster collecting stuff in America or other anime series. Uh, and Digimon, uh, you know, or Pokemon was the whole reason that, um, uh, if you remember a little entertainment company called Saban, um, that's the whole reason why they bought Digimon in the first place. They didn't want to miss out on the next Pokemon. Um, but Digimon was a fairly different experience. And like they, they became popular at the same time. They're both about monsters. They're both about messages of being nice and growing up. But it's in that last thing that uh, Digimon and Pokemon have a big divergence. In Pokemon, one never really has to grow up. Your childlike enthusiasm for Pokemon is something you can keep from age 10 to age 100. And managing to keep it is probably the most noble thing you can do by their logic of the universe. Every, every single game's ending is like, well, you know, you wouldn't have been a terrorist if you thought like a 10 year old. <laughs> um, and that's a really, that's a really pleasant thought. Um, but in Digimon though, growing up is hard. Um, it means saying goodbye. Uh, going back to that first poetic lyric of, hey, Digimon, the characters go to camp for the summer, and even if they're transported to the digital world, uh, they have to eventually leave it and say goodbye to their digital monster partners, just like they do with their new real friends, you know, if they'd managed to normally last out their stay at, you know, regular summer camp. And it, I want this panel to be as broad as possible. It's how Digimon came to define a generation and not how Digimon came to define one single loud nerd. Um, but the, at the end of one of my summer camp sessions, um, uh, I was bawling. Um, I couldn't even like muster like the courage to say goodbye to my new friends. Um, and so as we were packing up, I was like, I'm going to take a walk in the woods and I'll see y'all before you leave. And I hid behind a tent. Um, I felt like I'd, like over the course of a week, I'd been like, I'd been through with these people. You know, when you're stuck on hiking and on trails and shoved in a tent with other middle schoolers, you're like, you end the week knowing them for five days and be like, well, you're going to be my best friend forever. And then summer camp was like, okay, uh, Tim's mom is here. Bye. Um, I, I, I was ripped away from them as soon as I reached the pinnacle of comfort with them. And it was awful. And Digimon ties into that. Um, First off, by the designs of the anime creators, um, oh, we're here. Um, uh, particularly the lead director, who kind of hated whenever anime was centered around like one single guy. Uh, so they made an effort to have all of the leads feel distinct and uh, worth watching. 
Um, that way, if like Taichi, the goggles wearing protagonist seen back there waving goodbye to his best friend forever, um, isn't on screen, you're not gonna like skip the episode and go watch Kids WB. Um, it also gives you multiple points of attachment and relation, whether it's headstrong Tai or empathetic Mimi or hopeful Kari or conflicted Joe or, or conflicted Matt or anxious Joe or Sora or Izzy or Kari. It gives you a point of distinct relatability that isn't available with somebody like Ash Ketchum who isn't necessarily created to represent you, but instead to represent everyone at a certain age. Um, it's this point of representation that allows fans to instantly dive into Digimon in a way that they might not with other series. They see people, you watch Digimon, especially the first Digimon series, and you can see yourself in it and expand on it. And speaking of expand on it, uh, do you know how many pages of Digimon fanfiction there are on fanfiction.net? Um, <laughs> not, a, yes! At the, point of, at the point of writing this panel, uh, 1,675. And do you know when the first one was uploaded? December 4th, 1999. That date is notable because it's less than four months after the American premiere of the anime on Fox Kids. Um, we usually refer to like 1999 in like archaic terms, like not more like technologically complex than like two cans on the end of a string to make a telephone. Um, especially when you consider like the rate of like fan works now where like an anime episode will like come out. Um, and like within two minutes, somebody was like, oh, I was just doodling and it's the most beautiful piece of fan art you've ever seen in your entire life. Um, and I'm not saying that's the first piece of Digimon fan fiction on the entirety of the internet, but to have a show on Fox Kids, which was at the time mostly centered around American cartoons that were marketed in a very American fashion, be latched onto it by fans around halfway through and kids were already publishing their own fan fiction um, is pretty meaningful. And that's not just people thinking that Digimon is cool and wanting to write a few pages of Tai X Sora. Um, that's, uh, that's an online community being fostered. Um, do you remember the NeoSeeker forums? Um, where, you, where you'd go whenever you couldn't figure out how to get out of like that one dinosaur pit in Star Fox Adventure for the GameCube? Um, almost 20 years worth of Digimon posts are on there and it's still going. Speaking of which, um, the internet forum was created kind of on the back of like bulletin board style systems in the late 70s and 80s. Um, they grew and advanced and then around the mid 90s, uh, what we know of as the forum kind of came to fruition. A few years later, thanks to AOL and Yahoo and chat systems and forum hosting, they became infinitely more available. Um, and you had multiple ways to like chat all at once that was built on community rather than like strictly personal messaging like email. Um, role playing games began to crop up in mass. Uh, during this era. And there were a lot of franchises that seemed tailor-made for it. Oddly huge Star Trek, gigantic. Um, but another one that was big uh, was Digimon. I don't, has anybody ever, was, did anybody ever role play Digimon forums in the early 2000s? There's two, two a thousand times more than I ever thought there'd be. Um, one of the attractions about role-playing games is that even in a massive group, everyone serves as their own main character. Um, it's the magic of a good Dungeons and Dragons session. Thanks to your like creativity and the collaborative nature of it, uh, rarely does it become centered around like one guy. Um, and I doubt that's what they meant for it to happen, but it's like what I said about the head director of Digimon anime seeking a story where anyone can serve as the lead. Um, Digimon doubles down on this through the kids that it refers to as the Digidestined, or the Chosen Children. Um, usually in Chosen One narratives, uh, the special kid has some kind of ability that allows them to be like the head of the pack. Um, they're special in a way that like sets them apart, allowing them to be the ones that like, like shoot Voldemort in the end. I didn't read the last Harry Potter book, and is that how it goes? Yeah. Like shoots Voldemort, okay. Um, anyway, the aforementioned kids in Digimon are rarely special. Outside of Izzy, who was like the only elementary school kid I knew that owned a laptop, um, <laughs> they weren't prodigies. Um, but through growing in the digital world with each other and with their partners, uh, they could then become special. Um, it's the kind of thing that made Digimon roleplay forums spark with personality. It was about more than having a rad monster pal and being the strongest out there. It was about an internet uh, like an inherent internet kinship, a new fictional personality that was at its best when you played with others. 
Um, this character formula also gave you the chance to flex your artistic muscles a little bit in a way because you had to think, what is my character starting from? Where could my character go from here emotionally? Why does my character need a Digimon partner in the first place? Um, and there's, there's an allure in that. And there are still quite a few Digimon roleplay forums out there and it's extended to places like Tumblr and Twitter, places that have become hubs for anime discussion. Um, oh, and speaking of creative personalities and monikers for yourself online, uh, the creation of Digimon, if you'll check in that last, uh, check in the bottom left of that little Agumon card there from the trading card game that none of my friends learned how to play, um, uh, you'll see Digimon being credited to a man named Akiyoshi Hongo, who was an extremely hardworking uh, Bandai employee that helped introduce many of the aspects uh, that made Digimon famous and also doesn't exist at all. Um, Akiyoshi Hongo is actually a combination of names involved with Bandai and Digimon in its creation in the early years. Um, and, uh, but <laughs> Akiyoshi Hongo saves a ton of space, so there you go. Um, and, uh, you know, the email addresses and usernames of the world are full of people trying to figure out how to take your big dumb name and cram it somewhere or like how to hide your name with your interests. And as such, Daniel Dockery becomes XX anime lover 420 XX. Um, Digimon, by the way, was the first, I don't know if, if, if it was like this for y'all, but it was the first animated series that I ever watched that I knew was anime. Um, it, it, was, Digi, was Digimon your first anime for anyone here? Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my first anime was uh, Gigantor, um, <laughs> about a little kid that controls this giant robot that just beats the shit out of everything. Um, it's called Tetsujin 28 Go in Japan. Um, uh, after that, it was Sailor Moon, back when Sailor Moon was at like the mercy of early morning syndication and would come out at like 5.30 beside like Bonanza and the 700 Club. Um, uh, after that, it was uh, Pokemon, which was like dueling your time period to go to school. Um, and around that time, uh, there was quite a bit more anime showing up more consistently in America. Those anime Saturday mornings on Sci-Fi Channel and Toonami, which became a cultural touchstone for all of my friends. Uh, but for me, the first uh, show that I knew was anime was Digimon. And I've had people tell me the same thing. Um, now, they didn't all learn it the same way. I, I first um, heard th that Digimon was an anime because I called it a cartoon in a fifth grade class and somebody looked at me with more hate than I'd ever seen in their eyes and goes, it's anime. Uh, but the signs were there. Um, in fact, Digimon is kind of like the perfect series for kids crossing over from just watching Western cartoons to expanding their taste to anime. It's got a very um, American theme song in the, uh, the English dub and a bunch of jokes added in, but it's also pretty serialized uh, in a way that many cartoons at the time weren't. There were actual a there were actual anime arcs. Uh, there were a bunch of attack names being yelled, and there was a kid who wore goggles all the time. None of my friends wore goggles all the time. Um, it, was, it also unabashedly took place in Japan, if you go back and watch Digimon, uh, where it would have been super easy for Saban to be like, yay, Agumon, now we can go back to uh, Cleveland. Um, and, uh, you know, as a side note, uh, there's a weird tendency, especially in big media reactions to anime, to pretend that every new generation is the first to experience it. Um, it's why you saw articles in the 1980s about this new thing called Japanimation hitting your local Suncoast video. Um, it's why big newspapers were publishing articles in 2002 about how Dragon Ball Z was taking over the nation's youth and making them karate chop each other in the hallway. Um, it's why in the past few years, uh, everything from Attack on Titan to Demon Slayer to My Hero Academia has been heralded as anime finally going mainstream. Um, but there's been anime fans since anime has been here in America, and it's false to say otherwise. Uh, so I'm not going to join the Legion in saying that anime first became big in America because I was a kid when I first watched it, and thus my nostalgic memories are impenetrable. Um, I will say, though, that as the internet proliferated, allowing us to more reach in terms of learning about it and where it came from and how it changed before it hit our airwaves, that anime around this time uh, reached a tipping point. It became a staple of our entertainment diet. Uh, Digimon wasn't the biggest of them. A f for a few years, Pokemon essentially devoured pop culture itself. Um, but, and after years of start and stop promotion and production, uh, Dragon Ball Z became the action series by which all future ones would be measured. 
but Digimon's balance of faithfulness and localization makes it a particularly good metaphor for the medium at the time, one that had crossed over into our cultural lexicon and, would, and is never going to go back. Um, so we've established that Digimon is, at its core, it's about connection, a connection so strong that people took it with them to spread the good word about it across the internet. We've also established that it's about the internet, about how there isn't really that much of a divide between the real and online lives as some people would have had you believe before. Uh, 1999 was really big on that, by the way. Uh, it was the same year, um, an odd comparison piece, it was the same year that The Matrix came out. Um, a movie that if you haven't seen is kind of like Digimon. Um, <laughs> trust me, it just like just a few more trench coats. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the reason uh, that I think it's truly special is a reason that goes all the way back to the Tamagotchi, uh, back to the pet aspect, to the, to the monster aspect, back to Bandai's original question of why would this be fun? Now, Tamagotchi are a bit harder to clean up than Digimon, even though Digimon do their fair share of going to the bathroom, uh, Digimon be pooping. Um, but Digimon became more than just pets, uh, more than just a team of things to battle with, then heal and repeat. They became full-blown companions and partners, digital friends. Uh, because when these kids go to the digital world, they strengthen their friendships with one another, but primarily uh, the friendships that they find the most emotional validation and strength from are those of the digital monsters. Um, in, in a show about battling monsters, it's a pretty simple formula. Whatever problem a character is having that day is matched uh, by their Digimon's own need to grow. Uh, this growth is usually based around very physical stakes, like the titanic power of the episode's boss monster. Uh, at the end and the climax of the episode, the character makes the emotional leap that they need and challenges themselves to reach a new emotional peak. And as such, inspired and connected, the Digimon uh, grows too. Uh, uh, I found this gift online, but check out the Jetix logo. You go Jetix. <laughs> uh, they evolve into a bigger, more powerful form, and boom, the day is saved. Strength, inspiring strength. Um, but I think it's a little more than that, though. Um, I'd like you to raise your hand if you have a friend that you've met online. Uh, okay, now keep them, keep them raised um, if one of those friends is attending MAGFest this year. Okay, okay, it's about two thirds. Um, that's pretty nice. It's nice to have. It's nice to have good feelings every once in a while. Um, <laughs> it's it's nice to feel nice. Um, and I, like after the last few years, I, any any chance to feel nice, I will take it. Um, uh, keeping up with my friends online as we all huddled in our houses, learning how to like bake bread and binge watch <laughs> binge watch One Piece. Um, it, that kind of online connection is sometimes all you had to look forward to. Uh, whether you previously knew them in real life or not, uh, there was that moment of that message uh, where, you know, where, um, you got the affirmation that you were both still okay. Uh, it didn't even have to come in the form of like, hey, are you doing all right? It like it usually came in the form of like, you playing Among Us? Um, uh, but even when every structure that we know of was flipped upside down, forcing the world to either flip it back over or figure out a way to accommodate it, the people that you cared about were there and they were getting you to the next day. Um, in 2000, Stanford University conducted research about the internet becoming an even more prominent presence inside people's homes. Um, that jump to 41% in 1999 of people that used the internet in America had then become 52% within the following year. Um, obviously it was ripe for exploration, and what they found was that the internet had made our existence a much more isolated one. Um, that time normally spent engaging in other activities was now being taken up by sitting on the computer doing what you did on the internet back then. I assume you all did what I did on the internet back then and make fan sites for X-Men Evolution. Um, uh, look, I don't, I don't know what you're all doing, uh, but nightcrawlerishot.angelfire.com was thriving. Now, the problem, the problem with research like this is that it's always kind of imbalanced and tends to represent an antiquated worldview that's emboldened by its own specific qualitative measures. Uh, that there's some kind of inherent power to offline activities that online stuff just doesn't possess. Um, on the other hand, 
depending on who you are, you might find whatever level of enjoyment that you get through a real life activity to be more than anything you find in line. That might just be you. Uh, there are too many factors to say internet bad or escapism bad or vice versa. Um, uh, but I think um, I think Digimon proves it uh, to be kind of kind of a dealer's choice by the end. Um, the final boss or bad guy that the Digidestin face in the first season of the show is in the English dub named Apocalymon. Um, in general, it's a creature formed from negative thoughts, be they Digimon that have died or depression, jealousy, and social ills gathered from the world's digital, real, or otherwise. Um, Apocalymon has also given us some great lines, like the downright Shakespearean uh, quote, and I'm going to do it for you here. Uh, Why do you get a, to taste the best that life has to offer while all I can do is choke on its leftovers? Answer me this. Why do all of you get the pizza while I get the crust? This, this episode uh, would show up in the spring of 2000 in America, which is pretty good timing for an apocalyptic threat spawned by bits of the internet. Uh, since everyone had thought that the world was going to end thanks to computers like a few months prior. For those, for those two of you who remember Y2K, uh, my parents drove us out to a cabin in the middle of the woods as if it was like, oh, everything's normal. We're just hanging out here for the night, bunkering down. Um... Uh, every bit of chaos that you've heard about it is absolutely true. We imagine that computer cal calendars, essentially we imagine that computer calendars wouldn't be able to process flipping over to the year 2000 and would instead just like bug out and revolt back to 1900 and shut down everything on a global scale. Um, and like the most, <laughs> in retrospect, the most simple fix of this, we're like, well, we'll just make sure that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll tinker with it, make sure it doesn't explode like that. Um, so they can, so that the computer system in the world can handle a few scary surprise zeros. Um, but we didn't think about that back then. Churches predicted pure calamity, hundreds of billions of dollars in damage. People bought supplies and like my family, bunkered down in the woods as far away possible from the devastation caused by scary computers. And then the response on January 1st, 2000, eh, um, in retrospect, with all the anxiety about computers around the, that time, the root of the problem uh, likely wasn't just a fear about some zeros, but a general and generational paranoia about mass change in life. Um, and Apocalymon's attacks, when he does return the Digidestin to their base forms, a pretty great, if unintentional, metaphor for a world um, uh, that we feared would be reduced to an empty primal state because the dang old internet is out everywhere. Um, but the Digidestin pull through and beat Apocalymon, and after that, uh, it's time for them to go. Uh, a few years after I'd hidden from my camp friends behind a tent so that I wouldn't have to say goodbye, I got a friend request and then a message on my MySpace profile. Um, I hadn't talked to any of these people since they existed literally in my memories. Um, at one point, they'd been there, and the next day, they weren't. Uh, like flipping a page in a book to find out that there's no more pages left. Um, in his final monologue in the first Digimon Adventure series, Ty asks aloud, I wonder if Agumon will remember me. Um, that's more than escapism, uh, more than an online joke. It, it was in a way burying your, tom burying your Tamagotchi um, because what higher honor is there than a happy memory of someone? Um, but all of a sudden, there was one of my camp friends again contacting me in a way that never, they never would have been able to before. Hey, are you Daniel from camp? Um, we chatted for a bit, caught up, uh, reminisced about camp. Um, about the time I tried to make an argument that uh, P. D. Pablo's Freak -a -leak, um was better than any song by the Beatles, um, which I stand by. Um, and then one day we stopped talking. Uh, but this time it wasn't because we were forced to say goodbye. We just didn't spoke again, speak again. Sometimes that happens. Um, it was also something that a lot of my friends' parents never quite got. The validation of that kind of online return, whether you'd met them before in real life or not, uh, logging in and seeing that your friend was also there, uh, that the conversation of the story could continue, 
that the connection could continue. That even if you had to leave summer camp for a while, you held on to the things that made you better. Uh, you held on to your Digimon. Um, in 2015, uh, a survey of teens aged 13 to 17 uh, found that 57% of them had made a friend online. Um, in 2020, it was found that the average American had made six new friends uh, thanks to attending online gatherings during quarantine. Uh, they'd also reconnected on average with six people from their past. Uh, the most heartening one though is perhaps uh, the 83% that said that they were excited to hang out with their new online friends once it was safe to do so. Um, now Digimon's popularity uh, didn't exactly grow with the internet. Um, it's got a very passionate fan base, um, as this room can attest, but its presence in America was never quite the same after the early 2000s, where a series of programming buyouts and changes left it, you know, changing American networks and four straight years of new series left its audience dwindling. Almost 20 years later, and many consider it to be kind of a legacy brand, uh, something built mostly on nostalgia. There have, been, there have been new games coming out and new series, uh, but it still grapples with the idea that it's running on fumes or you know, is dead already. But Merriam-Webster defines nostalgia as a wistful or excessively sentimental yearning for return to our of some past period or irrecoverable condition. And I don't think that's quite what it is, even if I hold my early years of loving Digimon so close to me. Uh, because I think whether you experienced it or not, growing up in that turbulent time period gave you the chance to be a digidestined of sorts, a person thrown into this new digital world with people you'd never physically met before, people who would reveal themselves to have connective tissue to the things that you were interested in, be it video games or anime or chatting or creating these sincere and kind of beautiful collage shrines to Danny DeVito. <laughs> um... People that made you stronger because they reinforced a world that was full of possibilities and not just a rigid hierarchy of what life needs you to do as you grow up. Uh, people tried to paint them as monsters a lot, the farthest thing from real world comfort that one could seek out. But we know the words, we know how the words to hey Digimon go at this point. A digital companion, a digital friend. Uh, and y'all, uh, welcome back to summer camp. Um, I hope you have a wonderful MAGFest. Um, I'm, I'm, if, you, if you have any questions, um, I'm asked to see if y'all, if, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. Um, I, we are it's 3.43 right now, so we have a, a few minutes. I don't want to take up the whole hour so that people can, you know, get everything they need for the next panel to go. But if you do have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. And after this is done, um, um, just to remind you all that this panel can be rated on guidebook. Uh, we use, they use the information to evaluate how well your panel did. So you can be like, five stars, enough Digimon, or one star, too much Digimon. Um, so uh, just let me know, and I thank you all for coming out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from the front. Go ahead. So I know you had mentioned that internally was the reason that Digimon kind of fell off the way it did. Mm -hmm. But do you think it's games kind of helping this demise a little bit? Or just it's games being compared to Pokemon kind of hurt it? I think there's been a... So he was wondering if the... Um, the games have been compared to Pokemon kind of hurt it. Um, and I think, I don't think, um, I don't think Digimon really exists in this, in this country in the same way without Pokemon. I, you know, they, they were, one was brought over in full at the, in like the wake of another doing well. But, and often people see this as Digimon kind of being a Pepsi to Pokemon's Coke. Um, but, I think what was quickly figured out and what has allowed Digimon to remain so strongly uh, held by its fans is that it, does, it doesn't just offer a quick like palette swap to Pokemon. It offers a, a much different experience and one that 
especially as you dive into it and you dive into like the thematics of it and the fact that, you know, I don't know if y'all have watched like the series that have gone on the late, like the last Evolution Kazuna movies where they, the companions officially say goodbye. It offers a long-term experience in, that's different from kind of Pokemon's cyclical nature. And even though Digimon obviously is not as, <laughs> not as popular as the highest grossing entertainment franchise in the world. Um, and I think Pokemon's, uh, Pokemon being there emboldened an audience to find Digimon that normally wouldn't. And from then, those that embrace Digimon have taken it the rest of the way. It's a, it's a, like, it's a series uh, driven by the passion of its fans like few that I can think of. Thank you. I'm uh, the second person who's stuck in Digimon. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering where I could get started aside from here. So if I was going to get started with uh, Digimon, I would, I would watch uh, the original Digimon Adventure. Um, in terms of video games, I would... The, and if you wanted to, if you wanted to start playing Digimon video games, there's one that came out uh, this year that I felt like I was the only person on the internet playing at. It was called Digimon Survive, the visual novel. Yeah. It's great, um, but and but there's also a much more kind of standard RPG that was ported to the Switch, uh, I think, two years ago, called Digimon Cyber Sleuth, yeah. and that is that is it's a less like kind of niche game, but it's it's pretty great for being like, hey, there's a bunch of Digimon here. I get to see the designs of them. I get to kind of go in and out with all like the, as, as Cyber Sleuth is also like, it's pretty well written and you get like this idea of how everything connects on like a very digitally based level. So I would, I would recommend watching Digimon Adventure and then watching Digimon Tamers, which is probably the best of the anime series, and then uh, playing Cyber Sleuth for the Switch. And then if you if you've done that and you've set through all those three, then everything you know the the Digimon world is your digi oyster. <laughs> hey man, uh, I'm just wondering, have you ever read the book? And if so, where can we buy it? Oh, well, I did write a book. <laughs> Um, last year in October, uh, Hatchet Books published Monster Kids, How Pokemon Taught a Generation to Catch Them All. Um, and it's wherever books are sold. Um, it's, if you, if you heard this and was like, oh, I did like 72,000 Pikachu words, um, check it out. It's got a lot of sections about Digimon though, as well. And honestly, the Digimon sections were like some of the most fun to write because it was such a... You expect to write a Pokemon book and include Digimon, and a lot of people were like, why did you include so much Digimon? Because Digimon's important. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're interested, check it out in, you know, wherever, or not, just, you know, it's cool. <laughs> um, I have a comment, that's okay. Shoot. Um, I feel like we got really lucky with the local indie scene in Japan, because I feel like there wasn't really that many Pokemon books Example, spoiler alert for everybody. Um, when Wizard Mon dies in the Japanese version, it's like this really upbeat moment, like, you know, he's gonna digi evolve and it's gonna be great. But in the American version, it's so sad. Like, the music is so depressing. And so I feel like we just got really lucky with the show that had a lot of heart, but also because the music got changed over and the voice acting, like, all came together to be something that was really bittersweet. It's a so her comment was about the fact that we got really lucky with the Digimon localization and we really we really did I, I spoke for the book actually I spoke to people that were involved in the Digimon dub and they they obviously they add like some more jokes they make the music changes but one of the things that they don't really do and it's why it's why whenever people ask you to watch the Digimon dub or sub you kind of get to experience what true Digimon feels like either way because neither one changed the core structure um, of the entire series that much. There's just little bits and pieces of like handling it uh, in different ways. And it's a, it's, it's a really, we, we really, as she said, we really did get lucky because it's actually like, even at its most like eye groaningly like, hey, American kids, digital monsters. Um, it's, it's, it's good. It's, you know, the Digimon dub is good. Well, just be online. Will this panel? Uh, yeah, I think they recorded it. <laughs> La I don't know if y'all, I don't know if you, anybody went to the, the Pokemon Designs panel last year. 
Um, but they have a note here that says your panel is being recorded. Please speak into the microphone that we so we can that we can hear you. And I was like running down the aisles like a Tony Robbins seminar of just like, yeah, and with the Pikachu. Oh! And if you watch it online, it sounds like a man screaming into the back of a refrigerator. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope hopefully the, I hope this one turns out. Point and the high point of Digimon? Um, I think the... Hmm. I think Digimon's lowest point... If you go back and look at like the Saban official Digimon uh, Twitter, it stops around 2016 when rights for various series got mixed up and then it was just like, okay, we're done, no more Digimon. Um, I think that was probably its lowest moment because there were, it was after about a decade of so few Digimon games getting localized and released in America. Um, and like the anime series, there wasn't, we weren't really sure if we were going to get anything else with it. Um, and it, it, was, it, it was, it was kind of a, a point of like, well, this might be it. Um, did you ask the high point? What is the low and high? Good and bad. Um, I think. I think there are two high points. I think narratively and in terms of an overall great Digimon experience, I think at the end of uh, Digimon Tamers, um, when they have to kind of say goodbye to each other, I think it's, it is probably the deepest representation of the ethos where I was talking about where they don't want to go. You know, it's the end of summer. It's, even though they're not at summer camp, they just, you know, it's super sad. Um, and I, but I also think the end of uh, Digimon Adventure, where they're going, saying goodbye on like the tram, um, and Mimi's hat flies through the air, and either Butterfly in the uh, in the Japanese version or Hey Digimon starts playing um, in the American version. And even though everyone's like saying goodbye, you feel like you feel just like your friends that you've gone through something with them, and it. In, in American television, which, is, which for so long built cartoons to essentially last forever until they weren't popular anymore, to get this goodbye, but to but also get a kind of like, we're all sad, but we're happy too, was, you know, an ending was, it was just, it was really cool. It's a good moment. Um, yeah. um, did you feel like Digital Adventure Tribe was a good sort of like, she asked about Digimon Adventure Try, which if you don't know, takes place a few years after Digimon Adventure 2, and the kids are in high school, and um, I think if you, I, th I would, if you, I think if you re-watch the original series and then watch Try, it's a better experience if you watch them kind of back to back, I think, but I think, Try got kind of like mixed reviews because everyone is sad and fighting the whole time. It's not a very good feeling show. Um, but I think in terms of like high school, when I was like sad and fighting with everyone I knew, um, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's a pretty apt uh, thing. I think, um, I think its impact is lessened a little bit since they did the movie immediately after that was like, okay, this is the final ending for Digimon. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think Try is a, I think Try has its own kind of special impact if you're willing to look at it past like I need a Digimon series that makes me feel like the old Digimon series did. It's it's obviously a series that's that's allowed its characters to mature a little bit as messily as that happens sometimes. Good. As well as you know, they're still making V pets for Digimon. They make them into watches now. Yeah. The original Tamagotchi was planned to be a watch, so I'm glad to see. I'm glad they finally got around. Yeah, yeah, no. I, um, so I say it's like in every season there's always a, a Leomon that dies in every season. How do you feel about that? How do I feel about Leomon constantly dying? I feel bad for Leomon. Um, I think Leomon is a is kind of a uh, he's a very archetypal character of the character that you. He's a character that you like because he he gives himself for what everyone believes in. He is unfailable in that regard. Um, sometimes I sometimes I kind of wish that Leomon would survive the night, um, but I think uh, I I would have I kind of would have rather had it because this his the most impactful I think Leomon death is in Tamers 
when he gets betrayed and everything. Um, but I think, uh, I, I, yeah, I wish we could have reserved it to one death and every, everything else, uh, you know, Liamon kind of winds up happy and healthy. Is there anything else or anyone else? So Bandai has released uh, or brought back I think most of the most in the market. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's pretty great, but something that I thought was like really meaningful was advertisement, mm -hmm. where all the advertisement is not in like the traditional sort of, uh, we're going to focus on, you know, the 16 to, we're going to focus on the audience. Like targeting 30 or 35 year olds. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like, even when there's like one, one advertisement, which is like a 18 year old you know, Japanese kid who's like trying to come into the country, and then TSA agent, and they just don't speak, like, they, they have no means of communication, but the, the uh, TSA agent sees that the kid has a Digimon card, and it's like, you play Digimon? And yeah, I love Digimon, and they just like, you know, this, yeah. is, this is the best TSA agent ever. And they're like, stops being a TSA agent so that they can both play Digimon. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I don't know, I don't know what the point of that is. Do you think that this is sort of a thing where it's not necessarily going to be more nostalgia, but being like, hey folks, you know, we, we try to have this going. Yeah, you're talking about the mix of the kind of blend of nostalgia and constantly seeking a younger, constantly seeking a younger target audience is the name of the game with this kind of thing. But it's also, it reminds me very much of what like Pokemon is doing right now, where most Pokemon, if there's a, not most Pokemon commercials, but there's so many Pokemon commercials recently. It is like sad dude, sad life, Pokemon. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're like they're like older people, and then um, they play it with their kids or something. And it's, I think it's very much. Um, I think it's a smart tactic. It very much leans into the skid of the fact that, you know, by just having it repeat over and over to a cycle of newer and newer, you know, children solely, um, uh, is it, it limits your options a little bit. Um, but if you can find a way to make that balance of like. Uh, being like, okay, now not just that, not just it's for older and younger generations, but that older and younger generations can collaborate and connect on it. Um, I think that's a very powerful thing when done properly. Uh, fun fact, uh, speaking of TSA agents, I just left San Diego a few weeks ago and I had my computer bag and then I dropped it out and my 3DS and games were in it. And the guy says, oh, heart gold, pretty cool. Um, and <laughs> dropped it back in the bag. I was like, oh, nice. <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, two three fifty eight. So I think we should all uh, probably pack out. Um, but thank you all for coming again. And it was a great time. <laughs>